So uh, I think really I, I want to sort of introduce the context of the presentation and why I think tree selection is important and then really take a look through some evidence-based approaches for tree selection. And I hope bring you, if you'd like, up to speed with where some of the, the latest science is going in terms of our, our tree selection for urban forestry. So if you think about the urban forest as a, if you like, a population of trees, We've got hopefully a good percentage of those, if you like, in a space that's performing well. Of course, inevitably, there will be some that have poor performance. And uh, I think one of the things that we need to be aware of is that we have a number of different pressures. Climate change uh, is certainly one of those, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And the accelerated migration of pests and pathogens caused by things like global trade, really helps to drive that urban forest into that sort of poor performance realm and even into the tree mortality threshold, beyond that tree, tree mortality threshold. So we're likely to see increased uh, tree mortality as a result of those pressures. And I think, you know, we can hopefully all agree that species diversity is going to be critical to those challenges. Well, uh, let's start by looking at uh, an old book some of you may be familiar with, uh, Shade Trees in Towns and Cities by William Solorotov. And um, he actually outlined some, some of the first studies of urban trees. And he looked at uh, Washington, D.C. And at that time, there were, uh, this is 1911, there were 30 varieties experimented with but only 10 to 12 of those were really desirable for streets. So we're already getting the idea that um, streets are challenging conditions for trees to be placed into. At the same time in Paris, there were 11 species with more than a hundred specimens and, there, and nine species with more than a thousand specimens. And actually, if you break that down a little bit further, there were 17,000 horse chestnut and 26 oriental plain. That, those, just, those two species made up 50% of the urban forest in around, uh, well, the early 1900s. And, you know, one of the, the quotes from this text that I thought was really quite interesting was that all points considered, the oriental plain makes such an admirable, admirable tree, street tree that there is a temptation to plant it to the exclusion of other trees. And I think, you know, I'm tempted to suggest that we have in some ways given in to temptation, haven't we? We found a few trees that seem to work well for our urban environments and just kind of really planted those almost exclusively. And we, we can see that this historical legacy uh, has left lots of our urban regions at a global scale, if you like, uh, with really poor poor um, diversity. So in Helsinki, lime trees uh, stand for over 40% of the street trees. In Beijing, the pagoda trees make up a quarter of those um, street trees in the urban forest. Bangkok, uh, Terracarpus uh, indicus makes up over 40% of the street trees. And there's plenty of other literature as well that supports those sorts of trends. Perhaps the more recent um, literature you, you can see. In fact, uh, uh, one, one member of the audience, uh, Richard Howe, is involved with this. Um, so you can see here that the assessment across the United States is pretty damning as well. And, and in your Midwest region, you can see that a number of species are highlighted as red, uh, indicating they re represent percentages over an ideal maximum if you like. So in actual fact, in every single region, there are species highlighted in red. So th that suggests that we've got a dominance of a few species. Well, just to sort of build on some of that analysis, uh, looking at uh, open source global tree inventories, Nadina Hull uh, looked at mapping the diversity of street trees across eight international cities. 
and they looked at the sort of, if you like, the inner city regions versus the, the sort of more outer regions. And they, as I say, looked at that open source data and none of the city center regions met the ideal maximum percentage thresholds according to that famous Santimore 10, 20, 30 of the species genus family rule. So, um, you know, that again reinforces the fact that particularly the most urban of environments are really not meeting any of our diversity targets. And if we just drill down into that data, I won't go through it all, but you'll see, you know, I've highlighted in, well, it's all more pink than red, isn't it? But the, the pink uh, indicates the, the occasions where those species, families, or genuses fall, fall outside of those ideal limits. And um, we can see by something called the Shannon Index, which uh, is an index that captures the diversity, that all of the outer regions are more diverse than the, the more central regions. I mean, this is, let's say, in, in global cities, so Amsterdam, Bologna, Buenos Aires, Cambridge, Melbourne, Oslo, Paris, and Vancouver. So, you know, really consistent trends at an international level. One of the papers that I, I uh, really caught my attention recently was this, uh, this paper by Alain Paquette and his group in, in uh, Montreal. And I think this is a, a nice way. We won't sort of really unpack it, but effectively, um, he looks at a slightly different way to evaluate diversity, looking at something like uh, called uh, what, he, what he interprets as tree diversity, which integrates uh, species richness and evenness. And uh, I mean, just pointing out that uh, bar chart on the, the right hand side there, the, the left hand of the paired bars uh, stand for the total relative abundance of the five most common species. So you can see, for example, in New York, 50% uh, of the urban forest is made up of the, the five most common species. Uh, and, and then there's also this, this indication of relative abundances, um, which give quite a nice metric for uh, the diversity within those urban forests. And I think, you know, having a, an eye on the functional diversity as well as the taxonomic diversity is a really helpful idea and concept going forward as we begin to evaluate our urban forests in a bit more detail. And so um, the effective number of species or true diversity is, is this useful metric. And of course, um, it advocates a shift from the use of these taxonomic ratios to a functional diversity and evaluation of po uh, populations of trees into, into what we call functional groups. And I think that's going to be a really helpful idea moving forward. Then there's now a, a global tree inventory. I don't know whether you're aware of this or have come across it before, but there are, according to um, the inventories that have been done, there are, are close to 5,000 tree species in urban environments, uh, 1,200 urban tree genera, and 175 different families represented um, in, in the inventories. But that's likely to be an underestimation um, so that's quite a useful data set that you can have access to. Uh, the species status ranges, you know, from extinct in the wild to obviously um, potentially invasive or, or very, very common. So um, there's a whole range of different species across the, the different urban, urban climate types and geographies. And so if you're not familiar with that paper and you're interested in, you know, the global situation, then that's certainly uh, a worthwhile paper to engage with. Well, of course, with that lack of diversity that's often observed, we see real problems presenting themselves in terms of the vulnerability to pests. And this is a study that was done in Scandinavia. So looking at a whole range of uh, Scandinavian cities, so 10 Scandinavian cities, and they looked at just two insect pests, Asian longhorn beetle and citrus longhorn beetle, and you may well be familiar with these. Uh, and under the worst case scenario, actually over 
of the trees would be lost in those cities. You know, even under, if you like, more realistic or expected scenarios, you know, the combination of just those two pests would wipe out close to half of those trees. So, you know, there are really profound problems associated with the lack of diversity. I suppose uh, just uh, on that, I mean, cl clearly you're very well aware of the issues around emerald ash borer and, and the loss loss of massive uh, of, of trees as a result of that single pest. So, um, yeah, clearly it's diversity is something that will be prominent in your mind, I'm sure. So, uh, you know, the, the other major challenge, apart from those sort of pests and pathogens that may be coming along, are obviously related to the, the climate for trees. And uh, some of you may have had the chance to engage with the US Climate Resilience Toolkit um, I had a happy few hours look at, looking at this over the last couple of days, and there's some really interesting information. So it, it suggests that you stand to have a much higher frequency of extreme precipitation. So, uh, you know, in the Midwest region, somewhere between 40 uh, and 50 percent increase in very intense precipitation. And you may even be experiencing that. To now, in fact, in the last uh, week in, in Europe, they had some extreme rainfall that's caused massive flooding and devastation. And so these sorts of events are set to become more frequent. Uh, there's suggested that there's going to be an increase in, in the frost free season by nine days in your region. Uh, that may be good, of course, for some species, but that may reduce the competitive ability of, of other species. And so, you know, potentially. We're seeing it. We'll, we'll see a change in the sort of ecology of some areas as a result of those those changes in seasons. At the moment, uh, the historical data suggests that your average, this is annual average uh, daily temperatures, are around sixty degrees. So I hope that that sort of rings true for you. Um, but if we have a high emission scenario, it takes it uh, to around seventy degrees or so in your region. Well, what does that mean in terms of like really hot days and predicted days with a maximum temperature above 90 Fahrenheit? And at the moment, you know, by my looking at that map, you're getting, you know, 20, maybe 30 days a year greater than 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, by the end of the next, um, or this century, I should say, by the end, um, so by 2090s, you know, you're looking at potentially uh, certainly 80 to 100, uh, possibly even a little bit more in some regions. Um, so that's a massive change in the number of really hot days. And of course, from a plant perspective, that actually, you know, drive something we call the vapor pressure deficit because warm air holds on to uh, more water than, than cooler air. So that, that means that there is a, a higher moisture demand uh, on the plants. And so, you know, again, in, in, in your region, you're seeing potentially, you know, quite profound changes in the vapor pressure, pressure deficit and therefore that atmospheric drought, if you like, associated with those warmer warmer climates. And so that's really uh, important to understand because it means that we, we have to have a handle on how trees cope with limited water availability in order that we can then anticipate which uh, trees are going to be best placed in some of our challenging uh, environments, particularly in our challenging environments. And so this is where the, the foresight comes in because relying on those species that have served us well in the past really may not be a good strategy going forward. It, you know, as we, we anticipate these pressures of a changing climate, increased uh, pests and pathogens, we need to make sure that we diversify, but not simply diversify for the sake of diversity. Um, but we, we must divers diversify in those areas um, with those species that can meet some of those challenges, and particularly in relating to these uh, abiotic stresses.
And so that I wanted to really sort of unpack the, the, the water and the drought tolerance of, of species. And there are effectively two, two strategies for trees to avoid water deficits. One is to, to actually avoid them. And we'll talk about how that's possible. The other is to, to tolerate them. And a tree avoids a water deficit by maximizing water acquisition or by reducing water use. And really, it does those in, in three, if you like, three ways or in three categories. The first is physiologically, and the second is structural, and the third is, is life cycle. So in terms of maximizing water acquisition, well, probably the most important is deep rooting. You know, if a tree can tap into an underground aquifer or um, into the water table that may be quite deep, then it can effectively decouple its experience of, uh, you know, water budget, if you like, from precipitation. So it, it could be pretty dry on the surface, um, but because it's tapped into a deep water source, it's avoided a deficit, a really negative water potential building within the tree. Of course, the other way it can cope with uh, limited water availability is to reduce the water uh, it uses. And it does those does that through things like stomatal closure, uh, the re reduced leaf and stem growth. You, you see you know, smaller leaves, for example. Uh, there can, can, of course, be some structural um, hairs and waxes that can increase the resistance to leaf water loss. And you know, really importantly, phenology can play a part. So what we call drought, um, uh, yeah, drought phenology or, or um, a phenology that um, means that the trees are deciduous in the driest period. And you see that in, in Mediterranean species quite regularly, but also um, that premature leaf abscission that can occur through, through drought. And that reduces the amount of water that, that the crown demands. And then finally, and probably most importantly from a uh, tree selection point of view, we have mechanisms by which trees can actually tolerate that water deficit. So in other words, they can cope with low water potentials. And the key mechanisms for that are what we call osmotic adjustment uh, uh, that depresses the, the turga loss point of the tree. That's its, if you like, its wilting point. So it, it needs to be, become drier before it wilts. And there, there can be some quite profound modifications to the, the wood anatomy, to the xylem, that resist um, what we call drought-induced cavitation. And so those things can be really the, the target of our, our knowledge and our understanding and help us inform which species are gonna, are gonna do really well in drier environments. And so the first message I would say is <clears throat> to try and avoid the avoiders for the challenging sites. So um, here we've got on the left hand side, there's some lime trees. And this is in, in early July, a couple of years ago. And you can see that they look like they're going through full senescence. You know, there's a whole bed of dried leaves on the ground there. Uh, and, you know, effectively they're losing their leaves in order to reduce the demand for water uptake. And that's a strategy that they have. Um, but it's clearly, a, a, you know, a really stressful situation for those trees. And that's, it's um, damaging their performance in terms of ecosystem services and probably having a, a, a legacy effect going forward as well. The example on the right there is a, another species that you might class as a, an avoider, a birch species. And you can see it's really constrained rooting environment. And, you know, in the absence of any watering, I assume, you know, it's just basically lost all its leaves. Now, that may well be a survival strategy. When you rewater it, it may well come back to life, if you like, and produce new leaves. But it's clearly not performing well. This is not the sort of um, species that we might choose to select for those most challenging of environments. And so if we select the sort of drought tolerant trees, they have this inherent resilience to water deficits. 
and they're able to extract water from the soil for longer during the drying cycle, maintain physiological activity, and that sort of equals things like carbon gain and transpiration, which relate to things like evaporative cooling that we might be interested in. And so ultimately, these trees will perform better as landscape trees on, on the most challenging sites. So I think um, for all of those reasons, is really important to understand how we can actually select for drought tolerance. And so I'd like to speak a little bit about some of my own work in this area. Of course, the first thing that you can do is engage with the plant use and the dendrological literature. Um, and if you take a single species, you soon realise that this strategy is not necessarily that helpful. So Ace and Nagunda, you'll be familiar with, um, this is described as being useful for sandy, dry to sterile soil. It's drought tolerant. Its native habitat is along streams and ponds. Its native habitat is in moist um, areas, but performs all, well also in wet, sorry, poor, wet or dry habitats. I mean, that is really totally useless advice in some senses by an excellent horticulturalist who's really just sort of sitting on the fence. Um, very heat and drought tolerant, uh, grows along shores of permanent bodies uh, of water, and uh, likes humid areas, grows along stream banks, floodplains, and swamps. So, you know, if you're a plant user, a tree user, a landscape architect, or somebody that's specifying trees, and you engage with the literature, then, you know, it's really difficult to get a sense for how a species might perform, um, you know, in a sort of drought scenario based on some of that sort of commentary. So if you like, we can get a little bit more into the academic literature. So this is a really, I think, influential monograph that was done um, in 2006. And Dini Metz and Valadares did a, uh, a big meta-analysis of about 800 species and they ranked um, these species according to defined um, criteria um, of, of shade, drought and waterlogging. And, you know, it's really, a really helpful um, paper to read. And they effectively scaled um, each of those stresses on, on a one to five scale. And, you know, the drought tolerance one ranges from, you know, high levels of annual precipitation, uh, that is very evenly distributed through the year with what we call a, a high precipitation to a potential evapotranspiration ratio uh, with a, a relatively high soil water potential and a very short duration of dry period right the way through to that other extreme. So they kind of put some boundaries around what they mean in terms of the different levels in the scale. And that's really helpful because so often you get sort of um, qualitative terminology used by the author um, of, a, of a plant book, and you don't know really how it relates to you know, more quantitative uh, conditions in, in, in the field. So that's a, that's a really useful starting point, and you can use that to inform um, guidance and, and so on, and I, I have done. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But I think the challenge with the, looking at the sort of ecological literature is that actually survival doesn't always equal performance in our urban landscape. So think of that example of the lime and the birch. You know, those strategies of losing leaves to um, save water is, um, you know, a really helpful survival mechanism, but it doesn't really um, represent what we might want to have in our urban trees does it we want more than just survival we want really well performing uh, species so how do we go about improving selection decisions well i think using a trait-based assessment is quite helpful um, understanding ecological strategies and then you know more recently you know, looking at the biogeographical data analysis and using things like uh, species distri distribution models and so on can be quite helpful. I'm just going to talk really briefly about uh, some of those things in this next part of the presentation. 
The first uh, trait I'd like to bring your attention to is the leaf turga loss point. And this is uh, something that I've been looking at for, for a number of years now. In fact, uh, most recently, I did some work with uh, Jake Miesbauer at the Morton Arboretum uh, on, on the elms, elm collection there. But uh, this leaf turga loss point uh, can be used as a, if you like, physiological measurement of drought tolerance. It's quantifiable. And so from that point of view, it's a really good metric to use. And the first work that uh, I was involved with in, the, in this area was with uh, Henrik Harman, a Swedish colleague of mine that did his postdoctoral work with Nina Basak at Cornell University. And we looked at uh, the Acer genus, or at least 20, 25, 26 species within the Acer genus and uh, evaluated their turga loss point um, from the collections around Cornell University in the Botanic Garden and, and the, the university grounds there. And so we took uh, spring and summer readings and the, the drought tolerance increases with the, uh, a, a lower turga loss point. And so in fact, it's a more negative turga loss point. So I've ranked that, uh, graph there uh, according to their summer turga loss point. And we can see that those species that appear higher up the graph are the less uh, drought tolerant ones and those species that appear further down the graph are more drought tolerant. And so, you know, this was a really instructive uh, study for us because we were able to see that species like Aces spicatum that would grow here uh, in the understory, rather shady, humid, moist conditions, had a, a really quite a high turbo loss point. So around, in this case, minus 1.6 megapascals. But Acer truncatum that would <coughs> grow uh, in the Qingling Mountains in China, uh, again, rather humid, cloudy, cool environment, um, also had a relatively high turbo loss point. So those species that we might expect based on their ecology to be less tolerant to drought were coming up as being um, less tolerant to drought according to this trait. And then the species such as Acer tectaricum grow in the steppe forest of eastern Romania. Well, that came out as minus six point, uh, sorry, minus three point six megapascals. Acer grandidentatum came out at uh, minus three point eight megapascals. Acer monopestulanum was even uh, more negative than that, around minus four megapascals. Remember, these were all uh, collected in the same botanical garden. So this was, um, you know, really quite interesting finding. We thought, well, this is uh, certainly valuable for our approach to screening species. And even at the cultivar level, we were finding that we could discriminate between cultivars. And what's really interesting about these Acer saccharum and Acer rubrum cultivars is that Green Mountain and Northwood are actually the most westerly collections, if you like, of those particular species. So they're from the, the most dry, drought tolerant part of those species ranges. And we're able to pick up that they're, they're significantly more drought tolerant than some of their um, related cultivars. Uh, that are selected from you know, less dry regions. So if you've got a you know, challenging urban site, uh, you, know, you could take a, a scheme like this and say, well, okay, those that are, are coming back as, as less, less negative, the higher turga loss point, uh, they're not gonna be great if you place them in you know, really constrained rooting environments that are likely to dry out quickly um, and, and be quite challenging. You're going to be much better off selecting from those species that have got much more inherent tolerance to drought. I'm not saying that those particular maple species should go there, but I'm just saying as a concept, you know, that's what we're looking at. So the, the more a negative turga loss point trees uh, will operate and perform more effectively in the more challenging environments. And so really, we, we concluded that uh, that was uh, really helpful uh, as a measure of um, drought tolerance and could be useful for screening urban trees. And, and, and I think the other thing that we, we want 
to do with this sort of data is give evidence in nurseries that uh, convinces them to take on new plant material, because that's often a, a bit of a challenge because they've got to invest an awful lot in securing new plant material for, for the future, but they also want to know that it's going to sell. So, um, you know, providing them with a bit of uh, confidence in, in new material is important, I think. And so since that uh, first study, you know, we've done quite a lot of work uh, and collected well, hundreds of species now and used a whole range of uh, different botanic collections. And, and so one of the things that we can start to do is say, well, okay, those species that uh, have got a turgor loss point of uh, higher than minus 2.5 megapascals, we, we're calling drought sensitive. Uh, those that have got between 2.5 and 3, we're calling moderately sensitive. Uh, 3 to 3.5, moderately tolerant, and anything more negative than uh, 3.5 megapascals, we're calling tolerant. So that, you know, when we put together guidance, we're not using things like turgor loss point and megapascals. That's really not helpful for somebody that's not really engaged with the science. But what we're doing is we're taking those qualitative terms and putting a sort of quantitative framework around those terms so that we've got some evidence behind the use of the terms like tolerant or moderately tolerant or, uh, or sensitive to drought. So that we're try just trying to elevate the quality of information that's, that's fed into guidance. And the latest paper here um, is, is uh, one that's published, uh, well, last, last year. It uh, includes some of that work I mentioned earlier with the, the elm species at the Morton Arboretum there. And we, we, we actually now have got a, you know, enough data that we can start grouping genera together. So we, we, we're pretty confident that things like the magnolia and the birches are, are really much, much more sensitive to drought than you know, if you like the, the, the maples and the, the oaks, you know, as a, as a genus, there are probably exceptions within, um, with those, within those genre, but, uh, you know, we've got some quite good data now to support those sorts of general ideas. And we also got some additional data and did some analysis with that uh, Ninimets and Valadera scale. And we we're able to show that actually ecologically as well, um, those species that were reported to be more tolerant to drought ecologically also had a more negative turgor loss point. So we're you know, trying to sort of join up the dots and, and, and close the circles a little bit. Okay, well, of course, um, it's not just going to be drought that uh, causes issue. It's, it's also going to be things like uh, water logging. And so some of the most recent work I've been engaged with is around the waterlogging tolerance of different species. And I had a, a small trial that I set up at uh, Myersco. And well, we effectively uh, you know, had a containerized tree nursery, if you like. We then waterlogged uh, the trees in big buckets and used um, and, and then drained them. But we used a sap flow and gas exchange to measure the response of those trees to just short periods of water logging. So this is seven days. So this is the sort of um, short term water logging that we perhaps might expect with those increased precipitation um, extremes. And this is uh, Prunus Machiai. Here we see the sap velocity um, before the trees were uh, stressed. Here we're just introducing the, the water log uh, treatment there and you can see very early on within a couple of days we see that waterlogged uh, treatment represented by the dotted line really plummet in terms of its sap velocity as we get probably get fine root mortality increased uh, hydraulic resistance uh, to water uptake and you can see even after we drained it we had a, a reduction in the sap velocity within that tree and you know, one of the really interesting things from my point of view is that visually, although we were getting these really profound differences in sap flow, you couldn't tell the difference. So that was really important. 
excuse me. So if we look at that, where we compare the gas exchange, we can see that photosynthesis was significantly depressed within a couple of days of that waterlogging treatment. And obviously, somatic conductance was as well. And it never actually recovered um, within the, the time frame that I, I evaluated those trees. Uh, and as, as I just reinforced, this, is, um, this was not evident at all by the visual analysis at, at this stage. So this is Acer platinoides. So again, we had uh, a pre-treatment where the two cohorts of trees were very similar to each other. And then very quickly after putting those trees into a waterlogged situation, we see that uh, the sap flow in the waterlogged uh, group of trees really plummets. And in fact, interestingly, after the species or the, the treatments were drained, we got a continued decline in the, in the condition of the trees and the sap velocity, and, and actually, we ended up with a total defoliation, and all that was left was the samaras on the on the ends of the the stems. So that was a really profound uh, response to water logging in Norwa maple, and you know, again, obviously, you know that that kind of sap flow trace was supported by, if you like, the more traditional evaluation of gas exchange. And then this is a, a tolerant species, a willow species. The sap flow is, is rather noisy because it was a particularly kind of wet period in June, a typical Lancashire weather, I'm afraid. Um, but you can see that effectively, as, as the trees were waterlogged, uh, there's no difference whatsoever in the sap velocity between the two treatments. In other words, you know, they just carried on regardless. And then when it was uh, drained, um, you know, again, no response to, to that draining either. So we did actually pick up a significant decline in photosynthesis stomatal conductance at the peak seven day water logging. But it, in actual fact, that had recovered, uh, well, certainly by the end of a recovery week, um, possibly before that. So, so the, the willow we, we found to be much more tolerant. And the interesting thing from my point of view is that sap, sap velocity, sap flow can be used to discriminate between different species because understanding water logging tolerance is something that's not that easy. In, in trees. And so things like uh, the hypertrophied lens cells actually appeared even within a few days around the base of those um, willows. And that obviously helps with the, the ventilation of the root system and so on. So, you know, we, we know that certain species have particular traits that we can focus on and, and engage with to try and improve uh, selection for those environments. So the conclusions of that study were that sap flow could um, be used as a really useful tool to evaluate water logging tolerance. There's at least sort of three responses, if you like. No response in, in the case of the, the, the willow, a decline through the water logging period, and then sort of stabilizing um, upon draining, and then a decline throughout the water logging period, and then a continued decline after draining. And I think that's probably related to something called post-anoxic stress where you get um, stresses and, and toxins being released upon the reoxygenation of the rooting environment. And photosynthesis and stomatal conductance are very sensitive to, to water logging. Well, uh, yeah, that's, that's uh, you know, useful confirmation. But you know, perhaps more importantly for us as, as practicing arborists, the visual analysis is useless for identifying physiological stress. <laughs> and, and, and actually, you know, there are much better techniques uh, to do that now. So the final kind of um, sort of analysis and approach that I, I want to just flag up with you uh, relating to species selection is the use of big data, biogeographical data and climate data 
to understand species profiles. And this is some work that a colleague, Harry Watkins, has done at, uh, through his PhD at Sheffield University in the UK. And he looked at um, something called a warmth index, which measures the warmth of a, a climate and the precipitation or annual rainfall. And he collected uh, just distribution, plant distribution data, and then plotted that sort of um, that distribution onto its climate according to the warmth index and, and annual rainfall. And then from that analysis, you can understand the, the range and the types of uh, conditions that these, in this case, the magnolias were most likely to perform well in. And so that's really, yeah, qu quite a helpful tool. And so just to unpack that a little bit more, you can, for example, uh, by looking at the slope, um, understand the importance of warmth to growth. So the steeper the slope, um, you know, the more important, um, sorry, the shallower the slope, slope the more important the, the uh, warmth is. Uh, the length of the regression um, is uh, suitable for determining the range of conditions that a species is, is uh, found in. So if you'd like that, almost like the plasticity of a species. Uh, the intercept uh, can give us an indication of the relative importance of, of water. And, and obviously, sort of statistical confidence can give a, an indication of the robustness of the data. So, you know, it's, it's quite useful to be able to collect that climate versus distribution data, sort of pair it up together. And then uh, one of the things, neat things that Harry did was he sort of plotted you know, cities onto those schemes as well. And so you can see, you know, where a city, uh, current city's conditions, sits within the, the distribution of a particular species, if that makes sense. So it's really useful for seeing whether, you know, for example, London sits within the climate framework and, and dis plant distribution of a particular magnolia or oak or whatever you do the analysis for. So using these species distribution models can be um, really quite helpful. But just following on from that, um, Henrik Harman and, and Harry Watkins did this work on some important European species and plotted all each of those green dots on the on the, the charts there represents a, an, a, a, if you like, a published occurrence of that particular species. And then that's paired with the precipitation and warmth index. And then you, again, you can plot kind of where your city is currently with where it's projected to be. So you can see in the case of Ace of Platinoides, London 2020 is kind of right on the edge of that natural distribution. But in 2050, it's going to be pretty much outside of that natural distribution of, of Norway maple. So we might want to be really careful about planting that uh, in, into, into the ground now to perform well in, in, in London conditions in 2050. And so you can see similar, similar analysis done for acerubrum, petula pendula, carpenter petula. So looking at big data, you know, on, by the, uh, on climate and on the distribution of, of species can be really helpful in just providing some focus to understand which species might perform well uh, in future environments, which might be threatened by future environments. And so, you know, one of the things that I really um, believe passionately about is that lots of this scientific data and information is translated into uh, species selection advice that's accessible by practitioners. And so uh, a couple of years ago, Henrik and myself published this um, species selection guide for green infrastructure through a group called the Trees and Design Action Group. It's freely available. It's a, a, a digital guide. Um, and you can find it uh, quite easily on the TDAG website, tdag.org.uk. Um, and it's got about 280 species profiles, 
they are, I'm afraid, sort of uh, focused on, on those species that are available in the UK, but lots of them will be coming to your region as well. And you can see there's um, a whole range of information on the species profiles <coughs> relating to their use potential, uh, tree crown and size characteristics, uh, as you might expect, uh, ornamental characteristics, uh, other information that relates to the species that might be pertinent. So for example, you know, Aceplatinoides releases lots of pollen, it's got a high allergenicity potential during the flowering period. And there's notable varieties, again, they're ones that are more available in the UK and so on. So, you know, that's the, the bulk of the, the guide. Uh, there is also some context um, as well. And uh, as part of that context is just to, um, yeah, provide users with clear um, map, if you like, of how to use the guide and how to select trees. Uh, at the end of the, the, the guide, there's a, what we call a tree selector, where you can look at trees according to, for example, their use potential or their mature size or their environmental tolerance. And, and I've talked a little bit about how the drought tolerance uh, part of the environmental tolerance section is, is derived. Um, and there's this supplementary database so where if you, if you want to sort of select by multiple criteria. So for example, uh, a species that's gonna be good in a paved environment, uh, but also be tolerant to shade. Um, you can sort of do a simple kind of uh, filtering exercise on that. That's all freely available. Um, and to say part of that context is also just to say that tree selection is only one element um, in the road to securing tree establishment. You know, it doesn't matter if you've got the right tree, the perfect tree, if that plant quality is really low or the rooting environment is really poor or you just mess up fundamental bio arboricultural practice by planting it too deeply, for example, it doesn't matter if you've got the right tree. You actually need to make sure that you've got at least all these four things correct if you want to establish trees. And I talked a little bit about tree selection today, but of course we could unpack things like plant quality, rooting environment, arboricultural practices, much more. But I think that's probably all you can take from me. That's all I really want to share with you today. Think about those four things. Tree selection, we really need to be thinking um, beyond hindsight, what's worked well in the past, and anticipating conditions understanding how we can inform our tree selection through things like the use of plant traits um, to really um, evaluate the, the species that are going to succeed in the future. So thanks for listening. Um, my time, uh, you know, hopefully was, was well spent with you. Um, certainly was enjoyable from my point of view. Uh, my email is just there at the bottom. If you want to contact me, that's, that's absolutely fine. And just perhaps a, a little, uh, you'll, you'll forgive me if I, if I plug um, the book I, I wrote a couple of years ago with a, with a colleague, Peter Thomas, called Applied Tree Biology, which unpacks lots of the science around trees and hopefully applies it to arboricultural practices. So thanks for, thanks for listening.